I'm particularly pleased to be able to introduce this panel this morning because at Chevron we certainly agree that there is indeed a critical linkage between energy security and the environment. Access to reliable, affordable, responsibly produced energy is and will continue to be a strategic element for our nation's security. Our panelists this morning are particularly well versed in these issues, but at the same time they each bring a unique, diverse perspective on what we need to be doing on energy to impact our national economy and national security. Steve Clemens has agreed to moderate the panel. Steve is the founder of the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. And through his widely read blog, The Washington Note, Steve is also providing a regular platform to help infuse the policy debates that go on in this town with some pra pragmatic realism. Our panelists this morning, you have their bios in the program except for uh, Danny McGinn, so I'll give him a little bit more time. Um, retired Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn serves as the director on the board of the National Conference of, on Citizenship. He is currently serving as a military advisor on the board of CNA. But he'll be talking to us this morning in part from his perspective as a senior policy advisor as well with the American Council on Renewable Energy. He also serves as an international security fellow at the Rocky Mountain Institute. So a lot of different perspectives that he brings to the table. Also joining us is Christine Parthamore, who is a senior fellow at CNAS, the Center for New American Security, where she directs the National Security Program, as well as the national, the co-author of a book, A Strument in National Security. So again, a Karen Harbert and CEO of the Institute for 20, the Institute is organized to help formulate a common sense energy strategy for our country. Karen travels widely, both here in the US and internationally, to help to raise awareness and, and inform those policy debates on how we can take meaningful, realistic actions at local, state, national, and international le levels. And then Bob Kaplan, another CNAS fellow, joining us this morning, a noted author and journalist. Bob is also national correspondent for The Atlantic, where his beat covers the globe. And he's regularly turned to for his very insightful, thoughtful perspectives. Uh, you will also find his latest book out on the table out there, Monsoon, the Indian Ocean and Future of American Power. So encourage you to check that out um, during breaks. And with that, I turn it over to you, Steve. Great, man. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully folks can hear me. I am uh, Steve Clemens. It's great to be with you today. And I'm so pleased that Chevron uh, is, is helping to support the activities of the World Affairs Council in general. I, I remember when I lived in California and Chevron was based in San Francisco, they were supportive of the World Affairs Council throughout the state. I, I don't know who's here from LA or Irvine or San Diego or San Francisco, but I used to live in your organizations and basically attend uh, as many functions as I could through the state. And I think that the role of World Affairs Council across the country, I know I'm here to, today in part because of Sky Forster. Uh, he, he's off in Colorado now, but, but was running the uh, Pittsburgh uh, World Affairs Council. Uh, and, and we've been close friends, and I've, I've traveled to many others. So it's a great, great pleasure. And it's, we've got a cool panel. And we've got about an hour to have a discussion on one of the most important portfolios that any nation, not just the United States, would be considering, energy, security, and the environment are those topics which make or break nations. As you look ahead 20, 30, 40 years out, this is not a soft panel. These are tough questions. President Obama today is off to India, then Indonesia, South Korea, and Japan. And I have to tell you that a big chunk 
of the discussion points and talking points, the strate uh, strategy that will be uh, discussed with other global leaders will deal specifically with these que questions of energy security and the environment. We're going to ask Admiral McGinn to uh, help set in the next eight to ten minutes a quick overview. Uh, I'm a ruthless moderator. If you go over, I'm going to get the hook. Uh, and, and we'll do that. We'll have a discussion. I hope we can have a very active uh, discussion and exchange here. I know we're being uh, recorded live on C-SPAN as well, and we want to make sure we give uh, those many millions of viewers right now a very good show. So, Admiral McGinn. Great. Thank you, Steve. It's uh, great to be with you, and thank you to uh, Chevron as well. I know a little bit about Chevron having commanded the United States ship Wichita, uh, a fleet oiler, home ported out in Oakland, uh, California, when we still had some naval presence in the Bay Area. And uh, we uh, used to go up to Point Milotti, uh, right near uh, the uh, Chevron facility, to take on 7 million gallons of uh, liquid cargo. About 60% uh, of it was uh, what we call boiler fuel or DFM, marine diesel, and the other was uh, jet fuel. So uh, I know a little bit about uh, that aspect of, uh, of our energy portfolio. I've been a member of the CNA Military Advisory Board for about uh, three years now. We consist of about uh, 15 retired three and four star officers from all services, including the Coast Guard and National Guard. Uh, the C CNA Military Advisory Board first came together in 2006 to take a look at this thing called climate change. And in 2007, in April, put out a report entitled Climate Change and the Threat to National Security. It was groundbreaking in that what are a bunch of uh, retired uh, flag officers and general officers doing talking about uh, climate change? Isn't that something that uh, tree huggers and big business are supposed to be fighting about? You know, what, what's the national security aspect of it? But the report was groundbreaking in its conclusions. Based on uh, 15 months of uh, intense uh, analysis, talking to experts from across the world, especially from the United States, the conclusion was that the effects of climate change will act as a threat multiplier for instability in critical regions of the world. Now, when uh, the Military Advisory Board first got started, our chairman, uh, retired Army Chief of Staff Gordon Sullivan, said, look, I know there's a lot of uh, controversy out there about climate change. We're a bunch of military guys, and we don't want to come across like we're climate scientists. But he said, let's take this approach. If you wait for 100% certainty on the battlefield, something bad is going to happen. And we never have 100% certainty. So let's take the view, and I would recommend it to this, uh, this uh, group in this organization, that there are risks out there. That climate change is not a political issue. It is a natural phenomenon issue. And that we need to take prudent steps to prevent, mitigate, and adapt to the effects of climate change. Prudent steps. Steps that don't hobble us as a nation economically. Steps that don't impact our quality of life for our presently and going into the future. In many ways, when I hear some of the climate denial or climate skepticism, I'm reminded of uh, my own position regarding my home's fire insurance. I don't have fire insurance because I think my home is going to burn down. I have it because I can't be sure that it won't burn down. Now, if I had a visit from my insurance agent and he said, Admiral, got some bad news for you. Your insurance uh, policy for your fire insurance is going to go up to 10000 a month next month. I guarantee you I'd find a way to not believe in fire anymore. <laughs> I think the psychology and the reason that we are so charged in this nation, in this nation fairly uniquely as opposed to other places around the world, about this thing called climate change, is we've somehow made a connection psychologically that if we believe in climate change and we have to do something about it, it's going to ruin our economy and it's going to ruin our quality of life. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I think if we go about it in the right way and use this challenge of climate change in the right way, 
we can actually increase our economic strength and increase our quality of life, not just in the United States, but around the world. The other conclusion from this 2007 report was that climate change, energy, and national security are inextricably linked. The topic, if you will, of this form. So we took a look at the energy posture and put out a report from the Military Advisory Board in 2009, May of 2009. And the conclusion of that report was fairly stark. It said, America's energy posture is a serious and urgent threat to our national security, militarily, economically, and diplomatically. And further, that this vulnerability, primarily driven by our overdependence on fossil fuel, could be exploited by those who would wish to do the United States harm. So the conclusion was business as usual in terms of energy for America is not a viable option. We can't drill baby drill our way out of it as a nation that uses 25% of the oil consumed every year and uses, sits on about 3% uh, of the known reserves. We can get more of those assets, but it isn't sustainable over a long time. And in the energy business, you have to think long time. During the course of our deliberations as we put together our report on energy, one of my colleagues from the uh, military advisory board said, you know, I'm starting to get the idea that there isn't a silver bullet to solve our energy challenges and our climate challenges. And I said, no, there isn't but there's some silver buckshot. And what we need to do as a nation is we need to take a look at each element of that silver buckshot and create an energy portfolio that is driven by objective analysis and real data and take a look at the costs, the benefits, and the risks of each form of, of energy and create a government policy that gives some certainty that, to the market so that investors and entrepreneurs and large existing companies know where to put their money and let the market decide as we move into a broader portfolio that is less vulnerable to single point failures. Because think about this, gas uh, or oil, cost of oil on the world market uh, exceed, I think went above 84 bucks a barrel. Remember back 2008, from $40 to $147 in one year. We spent $386 billion out of our economy in 2008, over a billion dollars a day last year and this year. That is not sustainable. If we are worried about our deficit, if we're worried about our trade imbalance, we cannot continue business as usual. So what we need to do is look for ways that we can create an energy portfolio that doesn't exacerbate the effects of climate change, aggravate them, accelerate them, magnify them, and to do it in a way that enhances our economic, diplomatic, and military components of national security. I look forward to your questions and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral. <clears throat> now, just, just to remind, Karen Herbert, Harbert is president and CEO of the Institute for 21st Century Energy. And just to make this some fun, uh, one of my uh, friends, Bjorn Lomborg, has become a big believer uh, that in, in, in the need to move on climate change. But we're 10 years into the new century, uh, and it might, you know, and your report was in 2007. A lot of the folks, including myself, who've been uh, arguing that climate change was going to be a defining challenge for many countries, uh, think that we're, we're very, very late into this game. And so um, I'd love, Karen, in your comments, thinking about energy policy, to look about what, what the costs of moving late in, your, in, in the 21st century are. Karen? Well, thank you. I think, uh, you know, I'm no longer in the energy business. I'm in the reality business. And so I think there's a lot of reality that we need to get on the table here about uh, what we are actually talking about, what the nature of the challenges are. Because energy is no longer an energy issue. It's an economic security issue. It's a national security issue. It's an environmental issue. It's a competitiveness issue. And I think that's really important to understand because energy policy, the, or the way that we fashion our energy policy, our regulation, if done right, we will have the affordable, reliable, and increasingly clean energy uh, to power our economy in a very competitive world. Done poorly, 
we won't and we will be a second tier nation because our nation is dependent and our economy is dependent on that energy. And so we have to make a distinction that we don't have the luxury of trying, this is not an experiment. This isn't 30 years ago. We live in a very different world at the moment. I wanna talk a little bit about that. But we have to deal with the hand we've been dealt, not the hand we'd like to have. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about the hand that we have. And are we fashioning our policy response in response to the hand we have or the hand we'd like to have? I think what we are seeing is that we are dealing with uh, a policy response about a hand that we really don't have. What is the global energy reality? I mean, the energy demand around the world is gonna go up by 50% between now and 2035. And most of that uh, is no longer in the developed world, it's in the developing world. So the market is dramatically changed. We are no longer the market maker. Demand for electricity around the world is gonna go up by 100% over the same time period. And a billion and a half people don't have access to electricity and everybody's trying to close that energy poverty gap and it's gonna take a lot of money to get the energy sources we need into the marketplace. At least $26 trillion according to the International Energy Agency. I think the question for us is do we have the policy and regulatory environment here to attract any of that money and actually to meet our energy demand? I argue that right now, increasingly we're seeing, the answer is no. But what does the energy market look like going forward? If you, if you take the, energy, the International Energy Agency's forecast, you know, in 2030, the global energy marketplace doesn't look that much different. Fossil fuels are here to stay, and that's something we need to understand, accept, <laughs> and manage and decide how we are managing that here at home and are we becoming more self-reliant or not. If we wring our hands about the amount of money we are sending overseas and we know that we are 94% dependent on oil for our transportation sector and that's not gonna magically change overnight, are we investing in the resources? Are we able to invest in our resources here at home to bring those resources to market? No, we're not. Uh, and then we look at sort of the other inconvenient truth of how the market is changing and where the demand is coming from. And we see that 70% of the world's energy demand is gonna be not in the developing world, in the devel I mean in the developing world, not in the developed world. China is going to surpass the United States as the largest consumer of energy. But interestingly, uh, the Middle East is the second fastest growing region for energy. And obviously they are home uh, and resident to a lot of fossil fuels upon which the world depends. And they are looking now increasingly to satisfy their own internal market first. And then they're looking to their next consumer their next customer. That is not us, that is Asia. And you are seeing the entire supply chain in the fossil fuel area actually starting to reorient to new markets and next markets. And that's not this market. And I think we have to be cognizant of what that means for our policy framework. And then we have to look at where the resources are and how many more fossil fuels we're gonna need. I'm gonna talk about renewables in just a sec, but you look at the existing oil fields we know today and they're going into decline. And the new oil is in geopolitically difficult places, geologically difficult places, places that are hostile to foreign investment. And we need to find six times the capacity of Saudi Arabia between now and 2030 to meet the demand for oil uh, as we know it. So we've got a big daunting challenge out there and are we up to it? I think that's the big question for our policymakers you know, we saw a big election on Tuesday. That didn't change our energy reality. It didn't say, oh, now we're gonna deal with this set of books. This is our energy reality. Now it's, it's the same. And quite frankly, I mean, the response, Republican or Democratic, is the same. And it is the silver buckshot, if you will, approach. Um, it is that we need to realize that we are going to have to become more self-reliant. What are we doing right now? Are we actually bringing more oil and gas reserves uh, into the marketplace here at home? In the wake of the tragic BP spill, we have a new regulatory environment, we have a moratorium uh, on our Atlantic coast, on our Pacific coast, a new regulatory regime in the Gulf of Mexico. We've taken off large portions of Alaska. We have canceled leases in Wyoming, Utah, and a lot of other, in Colorado. So are we bringing those resources that have been off limits in our country for, for the better part of 30 years? No. Do we need more electricity in this country? Yes, so what are we doing in that area? Are we bringing more nuclear power uh, into our country? China has on the books 100 plants that they are planning. 
40 of which are under some element of procurement or construction. We have 26 applications in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and they haven't made it through the regulatory process. And it is getting more and more expensive and more and more competitive to find those parts around the world because we no longer make them here. And so we don't have new nuclear coming onto the picture. Renewables. You know, everybody would like to see more wind and solar. They currently comprise only 1.3% of our electricity. But you can't get renewable projects built in this country because we have a, a policy response that goes on and off like a light switch. Nobody wants to build anything anywhere. We have a banana syndrome. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. And that is, I mean, it is equally discriminatory against every sort of source of energy. It's not just, you know, dirty, nasty this. I mean, it's not coal or just natural gas or petroleum or pipelines. You know, we don't want wind off the coast of Nantucket. We don't want solar power in the Mojave Desert. We don't want to build transmission lines to move these electrons to market. We don't want to build anything. And I can tell you that's not happening in China. They're building a coal plant every week. They're building a nuclear plant every quarter. They're building transmission lines to move large amounts of electricity from where they are to where they need to be. And yet we're not. We have 400 energy projects today that have been stalled through litigation. That is about 250,000 jobs that were not created and a ton of investment in a time where our economy is desperately in need of investment. And then we have to think about what are we going to do to get beyond that? Do we have the political gumption to say, you know what, we're going to have to get some things built in this country? And right now, our policy response has been to talk more about taking options off the table. Uh, the piece of legislation that passed the House of Representatives uh, well over a year ago for climate change uh, didn't deal with any of these issues. It didn't say, we're going to have more nuclear. In fact, the nuclear title was absent from that piece of legislation. It did nothing to actually get more transmission cited in this country. So we have to have a much more thoughtful adult conversation that we are going to have to have a much more comprehensive approach that breaks down the silos that have in, in, in completely stopped energy policy in this country. We have 13 federal agencies, I used to work for one of them, that's involved in energy policy, and we have 26 congressional committees. So everybody looks at it like this, which is why we don't have a policy that needs to look like this. And so one, one, uh, you know, one agency demonizes another set of issues for another agency, and so we have this very bifurcated, uh, unintelligible energy policy. And that, I think, the fundamental thing that that means for us in the economic position in which we find ourselves in an increasingly competitive economy is that's going to kill us. And we are, we are shooting, to use a, a Texas terminology, we're, you know, we're shooting ourselves in the foot and reloading and shooting again. And we are unwilling to use the toolbox that we already have, the resources we have here, both conventional and renewable. We're not willing to build things to move these things around our country to generate jobs and investment. And we're not willing to compete internationally for the resources we need. So I think it should be a big wake up call that this is a time to start. We don't have the luxury again of, of the next 30 years. We've got to make some decisions now. We need that investment. We need those resources. We need the jobs. But most importantly, we need that affordable and reliable and increasingly cleaner energy to power our competitiveness for the 21st century.